What possessed you to want to swim around the entire UK? How many thousands of miles is that? Yeah, uh, 2,000 miles altogether. 2,000 yeah. miles of swimming. Yeah, yeah. It, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And then halfway around, I realized how big Great Britain was. <laughs> but you, you've done some long swims before, but not like nothing even remotely like what's the longest swim you did before this yeah i did um oh, this is a bit of a strange story i did um i tried to swim between saint lucia and martinique uh two caribbean islands um it's only 40 kilometers from point to point um and and for charity i was trying to swim uh from point to point with with a hundred pound tree attached to my trunks um so i was pulling the hundred pound tree uh six foot waves crashing down and, and i actually didn't make it from point to point i was like five kilometers from the end and um when I didn't make it, I decided to swim back the other way. So I ended up swimming over a hundred kilometers with a hundred pound tree. It took me 32 hours, um, but still didn't make it. So, so what, it was, what, what went wrong where you didn't make it? Tides, currents, you know, and, and oh, I, you just got swept away. Yeah. Yeah. And especially so, attached to a tree, right? <laughs> exactly. How big was this tree? Uh, so a hundred pounds, but it, I mean, it floats, but it was more the drag. Right. So if, if there's any influence from tides or currents and it's pulling you in one direction, I mean, I was basically going to miss Martinique. So I, I don't know, I was, I was heading to Cuba, you know, or somewhere oh. like that. And then on the way back down, you know, I was, <laughs> they turned to me again and they said, like, you're going to miss St. Lucia. You're, you're going to end up in, I don't know, whatever's further south than St. Lucia. Um, and I think I realized as, as physically fit as you are, um, the ocean just just doesn't care. You know, yeah. it just it doesn't care. And so after that, this was last year, this was November last year, um, kind of felt I had unfinished business with, with the ocean. Um, <laughs> came, came back to England, uh, rung up um, friends of mine at the Royal Marines. I said, guys, look, this is going to sound so, so strange. I said, but I just, I need to get it out of my system. I just need to see how far I can swim in 48 hours. So I swam 48 hours. Um, I can't remember what it was in the end. I think it was 160 kilometers, something, something like that. And I finished and, and I had basically trench foot. So where your, your, your feet and your hands are, are so kind of, I've got so much water in that it's almost going moldy. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of, yeah. So I had trench foot and I'm sort of sitting there nursing, nursing my feet. And uh, one, of the, one of the officers, uh, a, a good friend of mine, and they came over and they just said, uh, they went, you know, real English, raw marine. They said, you boy. And I said, yes. And they said, oh, what, are, what are you training for? And I said, uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm training for... Uh, potentially attempting the world's longest current neutral swim and then just paused and he, he, he sipped his cup of tea and he looked me up and down he just goes that just sounds a bit lame <laughs> i was like okay what <laughs> what do you want me to do and he pauses and he says you just need to man up you need to man up and swim around great britain and i was like <sighs> whoa and i can't i can't i, I couldn't say no once the you should have said why don't you swim with me bitch <laughs> i'll do it if you do it motherfucker <laughs> That's a crazy thing for somebody to be asking you to do. No, I know, right? So I, you know, I, I, so I said, fine. Once the idea stuck with me, I mean, you know, the, the, we've got this real history and heritage of, of British eccentric explorers. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, growing up, there was a story of Captain Webb. So the, the first guy to swim across the English Channel. And for those who don't know, English Channel, uh, you know, the tides, they believed were, were too strong. The water was too cold. They said, you, you just can't make it across the English Channel. It's impossible. But Captain Webb refused to listen, and uh, 1875, August, uh, crossed the English Channel, and this is the part I love, on a diet of beef broth and brandy in a woolen wetsuit, he swam, I think it was 23 hours, breaststroke, with his head out of the water, because, and I quote, front crawl was ungentlemanly like. And, and there was that element that I just thought... That's amazing. Front crawl. What is the front crawl? So, so basically, that's front the crawl. The regular one. Yeah, like, but way back in 1875, it was like, no, that's... He thought it was ungentlemanly. Yeah. The, it was, the movements itself, themselves. Yeah, it was still being developed as a technique, whereas, you know, if you were a gentleman and you were a swimmer, you swim breaststroke, you know. You wow. Do. Exactly. The head out of the water the Just whole time? The whole way, 23 hours. And again, like the, sh the, the, the support boat was saying, you know, get out. You're not, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. And he just refused. And 23 hours. So, you know, that's part of a night swim as well. Head out the water just all the way. Why brandy? Is he, get, is he getting fucked up or just a little bit of brandy? <laughs> Do you know, I don't know, maybe it might have been a bit of Dutch courage, but I think there was, you know, certainly back then, sports nutrition isn't what it is today. Right. So I think there was an element. He was even like uh, lubing himself up in, in goose fat. You know, this is way make, back. Make himself slicker? Slicker. And I think there was an element of warmth or that was certainly the mm, belief. Right. So it did, was the Tour de France guys. Didn't they drink wine? That was like a big thing oh, back in the day. 
way back yeah i mean it wasn't too long ago me and jamie were just just talking now about football back in england and it wasn't till you know too long ago i think maybe 100 years ago they used to just keep brandy in the dressing room in case you needed to warm yourself up really before you went out oh, yeah yeah wow yeah. so they would play soccer drunk yeah, kind of just like with a little bit in there, but like you said, just warm yourself just up. Just a little bit of something. <laughs> exactly. Get the old engine turning exactly. over. Exactly, yeah. Wow, wow. And I think, you know, people don't understand that it's taken, you know, people like Captain Webb, maybe me to a smaller extent, to just raise the bar, push the boundaries. And, and uh, you know, uh, you've seen that. I think our generation have seen that um, with the UFC, with mixed martial arts that has evolved so fast. Um, I always remember Forrest Griffin used to kind of liken himself to the basketball players, just shooting three pointers with the, the ball between the legs, mm -hmm. you know, and that always resonated with me because I was like, yeah, the, the evolution that we've seen and what sort of Bruce Lee had the, the foresight to predict is amazing and I think in a, in a much 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 smaller way again to go back to sort of British athletes and adventurers um, Roger Bannister you know first guy mm -hmm. to run under a four minute mile right. and, and people said couldn't be done and he was a medical student at the time leading physician said you can't do it your lungs will explode your legs will fall off all sorts um, but no he said you know Oxford uh, laced up his trainers and, and ran a four minute mile similar right now to what I think we're seeing with Kipchoge you know and, and the two hour marathon and mm. so that's why, in a, in again, in a much, much smaller way, when I had that conversation about swimming around Great Britain, everybody said it can't be done. Um, yes, it's 2,000 miles, but there's giant whirlpools in Scotland called the Corrie of Vecan, uh, Penland Firth, renowned around the world. If you get that wrong, you're disappearing backwards at 10 knots. You, you, there's no way you're swimming against that. And, and 10 knots, wow. that's, that's a dolphin speed. Jesus. Yeah. So what is know. 10 knots in miles per hour? Uh, basically 10 miles per hour. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. 10 so, miles per hour backwards as you're trying to go forwards. Basically, yeah. Penland first, so the top of Scotland, the currents that go across there. So it's running at a good clip. But yo, yeah. Backwards. I mean, yeah. I mean, we got it good. We, we, we managed to basically predict it so well that I, I, I think that was probably my top speed, which I did uh, 8.7 knots. So 8.7 miles per hour. I, I was basically cruising along the top, which is, wow. which is like a dolphin. So you, know, you were having the waves behind you, pushing you almost. And see, now that's what's interesting because I had the tides and currents with me, not necessarily the waves. Yeah, I, I said it wrong. And, and when you get, but, but actually you made a good point in terms of when you get wind over tide. So if you've got 10 knots going this way, but mm -hmm. you've even got a little bit of wind and waves going this way, it, it can get choppy. Oh, uh, okay. And, and again, sort of looking at West Scotland, wind over tide, you can get 40 knots coming straight down the barrel, but you're trying to swim with the tide. And Whoa. Yeah. So the wind is coming at you, but the tide is going the opposite way. And as you can imagine, that just... Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. So how do you predict this, this, this tide that you have to get right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's in completely in theory. And this is what I realized when I, when I sat down and we started pl sort of plotting the Great What British is it swim. called again? What is the, the issue that will push you back? Oh, just the tidal, yeah. So what is it called? That, that area? Oh, that you say you got to get right. Oh, so Penland Firth. Penland Firth. Uh, the Penland Firth. Penland Firth. Yeah, yeah, and mm. that's that. Like I said, renowned around the world, but but equally, if you imagine the shape of Great Britain, there's all sorts of kind of compression where the water will just come rushing through, and. As well as the Penland Firth, you can get, you know, six knots around Wales. There's an island called Skoma. And if you get that right, you are disappearing up, you know, and you're winning. You get it wrong, again, you're, just, you're going backwards. And for, wow. me, for me to do a continuous stage swim, if I'm going backwards, I've got to start where I was going backwards. So for me, getting every single tide right, and that's why I was so – the team were amazing. There was a uh, – the captain, uh, Matt, was just – incredible that every night the homework began. Jim, are we okay here? No? Did we crash? All right, folks, if you're listening or watching, we had a little technical difficulty, so this is not streaming live. We'll be uploaded later. We were just going over how you predicted you had to, and your team had to predict how the tide was coming because if it went wrong, you'd get pushed backwards at like 10 miles an hour. Yeah, basically. And, and, th and this is the thing. I think with the Great British Swim, we were kind of taking – swimming as most people understand it and we were we were removing it and putting it in a, in an arena that was so different so and i think that's why it was 
it, it did so well kind of online as well, the community around it, because obviously swimmers were interested, but, you know, surfers started to get involved because they understood the waves, um, sailors, fishermen, you know, all sorts of people started to say, you know, sometimes in Great Britain, it's not t safe to take a boat around the top of Scotland, you know, for instance, never mind a swimmer. Um, so that's that's why it was amazing that, that on the entire series, it became a, a melting pot and an exchange of ideas because nobody knew how to get a human body around the coast of Great Britain. It wasn't just about swimming. And, and that was what was really cool. How do, how do they know? Like when the tides are going one way or the other, how, how do they predict that? Yeah, I mean, tides are so predictable. So in theory, um, they change every six hours. So in theory, when we sat down and we looked, um, we know that if you do six hours on, six hours off, for 157 days, you'll make it around the coast of Great Britain. You know, and, and, and that was the theory. So you do this biphasic sleep mm -hmm. and, and you swim for 12 hours a day. But that's all theory. There's times when, as I mentioned, uh, giant whirlpools or, or the tides might not necessarily, if you imagine sort of that's Great Britain there, the tides don't necessarily go always like this. So they're not that predictable. Sometimes if there's kind of like this, like that's kind of whales there, the tides will do this. So you'll you're, kind of you're, do you're doing all these different things that people are not going to see. <laughs> right. Uh, if so, they're listening to it on audio. So just try to just describe it. Right. So basically, rather than the tides just going up and down and working with you, mm -hmm. um, sometimes, sometimes they cross. Cross. Yeah. So you're just kind of mm. getting slapped across the face by yeah. tides, essentially. And it's not just helping you. You're going to basically zigzag all the way up the coast of Great Britain. So as predictable as tides are, we found there was so much stuff that when we were out there, we were like, oh, it wasn't meant to do that. Or mm. a giant whirlpool wasn't meant to be there, you know, but it is. And, and that was what was, you know, pretty, yeah, pretty sketchy at some times, you know, that when we were out there, if a whirlpool just decides to appear, you've got, you, you, there's not really enough time to say, oh, hang on, that wasn't on the map. Can we look at that? Can we speak to the Met Office and, and talk about, you know, weather reports? No, you just... You either had to swim through it or, or try and get out there as quick as you could. So when you encounter something like that and you get stuck, do you pull out of the water and try back again later at the same location? You do, but quite often if it was there, it's still going to be there. Oh, it's just, it is what it is. Yeah. So, so sometimes there's, there's no option. And, and perhaps the best example of this, um, I mentioned it before, it's called the Corrie of Ecken, So uh, sort of west coast of Scotland. And um, it's a giant whirlpool. And, and Matt, the captain, turned to me and said, look, Ross, you know, I need you to swim and I need you to swim hard. You know, you need to swim six hours. You just need to be clear of this whirlpool. Um, so as we were swimming past it, I set my watch and I swam hard for six hours. But about three hours in, um, I got stung by a jellyfish. And I'd been stung by jellyfish a lot before. It's just, you know, it's painful, but it was, it was bearable. Um, but this one particular jellyfish, it just, it was searing into my skin. It just, it wouldn't stop throbbing and so I, I carried on swimming three hours passed and and it was just unbearable so I popped my head up and I looked at Matt the captain from the boat I said Matt I'm so sorry I've been stung I'm gonna, you know I'm gonna have to stop um I've been stung by a jellyfish but it's, the pain's just not going away and as, as I said that to him he looked down at me and he said yeah I know because the tentacle's still wrapped around your face so I'd basically been swimming for three hours with a jellyfish on your face <laughs> wearing a jellyfish oh. so it had wrapped into my goggles so I took my goggles oh. off unpeeled this fat tentacle threw it away um and then like i said i'll, I'll show you in a minute I'll, I'll, but there was a picture where my my face sort of changed shape and the goggles wouldn't fit on my face anymore because my my eye sockets were so swelled um but i knew that again for all of this happening the cory of and the giant whirlpool was still to my left so matt was like you still need to swim you still need to swim so i ended up putting the goggles over my face and to try and get them to seal I just punched them into my face. So you just had these perfect ring. And then I managed to- Because you were so swollen. Yeah. So you had to push them through the swelling. Basically, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> so you swim. Um, I made another hour. We, we got clear of the Corrie of Ekans. We managed to clear this giant whirlpool. I collapse onto the boat. And, um, and this is the thing. It was at that point that I collapsed, exhausted, face, now a different shape to when I started that particular swim. And- um, and the team looked at me and they saw how bad I was, how, how beaten up I was. But they also knew that, that the sea just doesn't care. And in six hours, the tide was going to change and I'm going to have to do that all over again. Wow. And, and it was that kind of brutal lesson from nature that, that from a sports science background, I'm interested in, you know, rehab, rest, recovery, nutrition strategies, all of this. But with swimming around Great Britain, it, it very quickly became apparent that 
the sea just doesn't care. It just doesn't care that, that you need to rehab your shoulders. It doesn't care that the ligaments and tendons in your shoulders are hurting. You might get impingement from swimming too much. You know, none of this. And um, that's why it went from swimming, as I understood it, and how a lot of people understand it, to something completely like surviving, basically, in the water. So your swimming schedule would be six hours on, and then you would try to rest. When would you eat? Uh, during the swims or, or, or between? And during the swims. Yeah, yeah. So quite often just, you know, throwing bananas at me and, and just... Wow. Uh, you salty know, bananas. Basically, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> just salty bananas. And, and you'd eat them while you're in the water? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because again, going back to what we were talking about with the Pendulum Firth, you could get out and you could get on the boat, but sometimes in a really good tide... If you are just in the water, you could be making four knots. You don't have to swim, but if you get in the freezing cold water of Scotland and you are quite happy getting hit in the face by tentacles, you can still make four knots. And so that's why so often it became about uh, something different than swimming. It was just it was just mental fortitude. It was physical fortitude. It was um, basically, and I always remember actually, uh, first day of autumn, um, I got up, it was two o'clock, so it was a night swim, two o'clock in the morning. And I left my wetsuit out to, to dry and um, I had to scrape just a thin layer of ice off the wetsuit before I could put it on. <laughs> but if I didn't, if I didn't get in and I didn't scrape that, that, that wetsuit, then that would have been, you know, 15 miles potentially that we would have missed out on. And if mm. you miss those 15 miles, the, the window of opportunity to swim around Great Britain because of the British summer being notoriously unpredictable and quite short, um, we wouldn't have made it round because even towards the end, there was two storms, uh, Storm Alum and Storm Cali, uh, uh, Ali and Callum, who kind of stopped us for those two days where we couldn't swim because you, you just couldn't swim in a storm. It wasn't safe. So when you were swimming, this was all during the summer? Yeah, yeah, uh, through the autumn. And then we finished November the 4th, which was going into the winter oh. as well. <laughs> and you started what month? Uh, June the 1st. So for since June, you've been swimming? Yeah, basically. God damn, man. 